Well, good morning and welcome to today's edition of Daily Bread. It's our online daily devotional for Christ Church. My name's Chris, and I'll be filling in for Pastor Aaron for our daily devotion this morning. And before we begin, let's ask for the Lord's blessing on our time together. Our Father in heaven, the secret things belong to you, the Lord our God. And there are many things that we do not know. And there are many things that we cannot know. Please help us to place our faith and our trust in you, whom we do know. And please help us to put our trust in those things that you have revealed to us in your word, that we might have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, I thought I'd begin with a meditation from a book I often use for my own devotions or from my family devotions called Flowers from a Puritan's Garden by Charles Spurgeon. So if you're not familiar with Spurgeon, he was a 19th century English preacher, and he has some really helpful meditations that we can learn from, and I highly recommend this book. Spurgeon was a master at giving great illustrations. And as I read it, I'll modernize it a little bit. Spurgeon begins by quoting from a Puritan preacher named Thomas Manton, who says, Before corn can be ripened, it needs all kinds of weather. The farmer is happy to see showers, as he is to see su sunshine. Rainy weather is troublesome, but sometimes the season requires it. And then Spurgeon writes, In the same way, the different conditions of a man's life are necessary to ripen him for the life to come. Sorrows and joys, depressions and exhilarations all have their part to play in the growth of Christian character. If one little grief of a believer's life was canceled, it could be he would never be prepared for heaven. The slightest change might ruin the ultimate result. God, who knows best how to ripen both corn and men, orders all things according to the counsel of his will. And we are wise if we believe and trust in the infallible perfection which arranges all the details of a believer's life. All things work together for good. So Spurgeon closes this short meditation with a quote from Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Uh, that's Romans 8, 28. And I'd like to focus on that verse this morning. Romans 8, 28 reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So sometimes as Christians, we fall into the trap, and this is easy to do. We can be led into the trap of thinking that as Christians, everything should always go our way that Jesus will solve all of our problems so that we'll always be happy. And what's worse, this kind of thinking draws false teachers who promise that believing in Jesus is a way to become healthy or a way to become wealthy, as if Jesus is some kind of good luck charm. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say that God will take every discomfort you have in this life and completely erase it. Look at the life of Jesus Christ. That's not how his life was. That teaching is a false gospel. Teachings like that will actually drive you away from the truth. But as we see in Romans 8, 28, the Bible does teach that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. The Bible teaches that God is so powerful, that God is so in control of all things, that God loves his beloved children so much that he will use every situation in their lives, whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable. He'll use every occurrence in their lives for their good. This is sometimes hard to believe. So not long after I became a Christian, a Christian woman I looked up to was diagnosed with lung cancer. Now she trusted in the Lord. She'd been a Christian for many years, 
and she thought that she would be healed from her cancer. We prayed for her to be healed. And as Christians, that is a good thing to pray for. As a young Christian, I believed that she would be healed. And her church taught that if she just had enough faith, she would be healed. And as her disease progressed, she got sicker. Well, the teachers in her church told her that it was because of her lack of faith that she wasn't healed. They told her that it must be something outstanding in her life. It might be a sin that she was guilty of. And that, wasn't, that was the reason why she wasn't being healed. And I hope that if you hear false teaching like that, that you know enough to run away from it. Can you imagine that the, the burden that this placed on this suffering woman? I can tell you that it placed a huge burden, not only on her, but on her family. And I can tell you the burden that it placed on me as a young Christian. And especially then, as this dear sister died from her cancer. So instead of receiving the comfort from her teachers, she was receiving blame. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't heal. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for healing. We should. But we also need to remember to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there are so many questions that we can't answer about trials and suffering. But there are some things that we do know. And there are some things that we can state with confidence and with faith. That even when our will is not being done, in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches the same thing. In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 9 through 11, Jesus says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? And if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? When we look around and we see the magnitude of suffering that's going on in the world and in our own country because of COVID-19, we can be tempted to think, where is God in all of this? And what is God doing? And we certainly don't know everything, but we do know with confidence that God, the judge of all the earth, is always doing what is right and what is good for those who love him. So what's one way that we can see God working for the good of those who love him when they're suffering or when we're suffering. So I've been thinking about this and I'll ask you a question that I've been asking myself during this time. If God was to flip a switch, as it were, and completely erase the virus so that tomorrow everything went back to normal, the stock market took off, you went back to work under normal conditions, and your 401k and your retirement funds were back to all-time highs. All your fears of sickness for yourself and for your loved ones were wiped away. Would you be satisfied with that? If everything went back to normal, would you be satisfied with that? So before COVID-19, where were you finding your peace and your contentment? Augustine who lived during the fourth century. He was one of the, the great teachers of the early church. And he wrote one of my favorite sentences. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. See, God did not create us so that we would find our rest or our comfort or our peace in our outward circumstances. God didn't create the good things of the world so that we would find our satisfaction in them. He created us in all things so that we might find our rest, our peace, our satisfaction, and even our joy in him alone. So you remember how God revealed himself to Abram in Genesis 15. He said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. God himself is our hope. God himself is our reward. 
So one blessing I see from my Heavenly Father in this pandemic is that COVID-19 is a gracious and a merciful call from God to me and to you to turn from finding comfort in the things of this world and to turn to him to find our peace and our joy and our contentment in him alone. If you believe and trust in Jesus Christ, you can believe and trust that as Spurgeon says, every sorrow and joy, every depression and exhilaration are preparing you for growth in this life and in the next. If you trust in Christ, remember that Jesus is using every specific circumstance in your life to draw you closer to himself. He is your very great reward. Do you trust him to use every circumstance, not only every sorrow, but even every happiness in your life to give you what's best? That's himself. Do you trust that he is doing this in love for you? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Paul goes on in Romans 8 and verse 35 to ask, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And he answers this question in verse 38. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the Christian's great comfort and great hope. And if you have not placed your trust in Jesus Christ for new life, the difficult circumstances that you are experiencing and will experience call you to repent, to turn from your sin to Jesus Christ. Have you considered, if you are not a Christian, that everything that you place your trust in, everything, every place where you find your comfort in this world, it will one day pass away. You will lose it all. Everything you hope in will ultimately decay. But in Jesus Christ, there is no decay. Through Jesus' death for sin, he has defeated sin. And through Jesus' resurrection from the dead, he has overcome even death. And through Jesus' position now in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, he is renewing all things. He is even giving life to those who were once dead in their sins. So I'd like to close today by uh, singing Psalm 42. If you follow our uh, church worship services on the Lord's Day, we've recently sung Psalm 42. And in Psalm 42, we see a child of God who's depressed. He's suffering. And his enemies around him say, where is your God? But he gathers his wits and he reminds himself and he reminds us that God is his very great reward. So he says in, in verse 5, Oh, why, my soul, do you grow ill? And why are you cast down in me? Hope now in God. I'll praise him still. My helper and my God is he. Thank you. Christ,